All right, welcome back to It's Only Money with financial advisor Scott Brown with Edgewater Family Wealth. You can get a hold of Scott at 407-648-1881 or edgewaterfamilywealth.com. We also have Tammy here as well. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you, fellas. Uh, let's just jump right into it. I like this where we, we run the numbers down with Tammy right off the bat. Yeah, let's get the fun part right out of the way. Tammy and I were, uh, as we always do in our intense preparation for our show, for those of you who think I'm just making this up, which is actually true. But um, <laughs> So, uh, yes, we did actually have a conversation this morning about a few things, and I noticed some interesting numbers, Tammy, on um, the March returns. What, mm-hmm. what, did, what did we do in March? So the S&P was up uh, almost 3.7 for March. Just for the month? Just for the month. Not too shabby. Yeah. And what, so here's a question. What Historically, what's the best month for stocks if you look back over, say, the last, I don't know, 50, 100 years or whatever it is? <laughs> for the length of the so stock market. Some very long period of time. Yeah. So the best month historically has been April. April. Yeah, Weird. Me. Did you know that, Ryan? I did not. I, I, I always find it's fun when they have facts like that. Like there's a there's a safest month to fly as well, and I think it's like May. May's the safest. Because yeah. I'm flying in May, so that's good to hear. There you go. But I'm also flying in June. You're not going to tell me that's the worst month. Ooh, but, uh, but no. 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 <laughs> I think nice September's know. the worst one. It's been nice knowing you guys. So, <laughs> um, all right. So let's. So the the best month has been April. Mm-hmm. Um, if we talk about the returns of the S and P, you and I were discussing. We were both surprised to find that how many out of the last thirty years, how many have been positive ten percent or more? Oh uh, well, that is about um, let's say nineteen of the last thirty years. So Ryan, nineteen of the last thirty mm. years, the market has been up over ten percent. So statistically, again, if you're playing the game and you say. I'm going to outsmart the market. Why, with understanding a number like that, why would you even think you need to outsmart the market? Right. Seems like it's doing doing that job on its own more than half the time. Yeah, it's doing the heavy lifting for you. So, I mean, I think sometimes when we read these statistics, people kind of glaze over and think, well, what does that mean to me? What it means to you is you don't have to get cute to make money long-term in the stock market. We've discussed that there are, sure, there's uh, every three or four years we have a down year. Um, but if you look at five and 10 and 20 year periods, there's almost no chance you're going to lose money if you're disciplined and hang in there. Um, one of the, one of the interesting things I did read this morning that was a bit of a head scratcher was that, uh, it's anticipated Ryan, that, uh, the national debt will reach 44 trillion by 2032. Now as a boomer, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. That's such a large number. I've, I've read before that the human mind can't even really process it. No, no. You've seen the clock in New York City that's yes. constantly like nobody's paying attention to that. It's just flashing lights at this point. Yeah, so. we could save a lot of money on that debt by like getting rid of that clock. I'm that sure that takes is, money to maintain. That's part of the problem, I think. <laughs> Self-serving. So, um, And then one other interesting thing Tammy and I were talking about is that the fifth and sixth largest cities in the U.S. back in 1950 were Detroit and Baltimore, respectively. Mm-hmm. Today, uh, they are, I think, 27th and 28th. So, so people are moving around. But, Tim, you were telling me Tampa. Yeah, Tampa Bay. Two years ago, um, I read somewhere, and that was two years ago, we had around 300 to 350 people moving in. Every day. Every week. Following Tom Brady. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I would follow Tom Brady to Tampa. Yeah. If I, especially sense. if I'm from New England. You know, it's nicer there. Yeah. He seems in a better mood. He does seem a happier guy. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, this is, you know, just catching people up on numbers. I think one of the things that um, people get caught up in more than the long term numbers. And the reason I emphasize these long term numbers is because people get caught up in the day to day numbers. Um, and I think that. It's not, it's not a healthy thing. We, again, we talk about recency bias on this show all the time. And if you're focused purely on what happened this year or what's right in front of you, you're kind of missing the boat. Sometimes it's better just to put your head down and run into the wind. But how long do you do that for? I mean, because it's so counterintuitive to being, you know, a human. You're like, oh, let's go and rest. Don't go and rest. Don't go and rest. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I mean, so is there a time that you pull that, pull that trigger? 
Well, there, there's no specific time. Again, you're, you, each thing has its own nuance, whether you're talking about a stock or a mutual fund or any kind of investment, real estate, whatever it is. And we again, we talk last, we've talked probably three weeks in a row now about homes and how people believe that their homes are their best investments. And I argue, and I will continue to argue, the reason for that is not the return itself, because we know that homes have not out-earned the S&P 500 over the last 50 years. What we do know is if Ryan buys a house and he wakes up tomorrow and finds out that the house is worth 10 grand less than he paid for it, he's not going to sell it because he likes shelter. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I live there. And that, that again, that's the problem. I wanted to sell my house when suddenly, for no reason, it seems it was worth 80,000 more and there was nowhere to go. There's, well, there's nowhere to go because the house you're going to buy is worth 80000 more, too. So thankfully, yes. your fiancé uh, had the good sense to talk you out of that. And i thank been thankful for her every single day because I would make these willy-nilly decisions much like I do on an app. But when you say that the housing market over the long run doesn't outperform the stock market, do these, these, so these little bursts, I mean, my house is going to go back down then. Sure. At some point, you'll have a bad year in the housing market. And and and. Quite frankly, it could be this year or next year because what we're seeing is we have a headwind in the fact that rates are going up. So people like to buy houses when rates are low because they can get more house for their monthly dollar, if you will. My payments, you know, I used to be able to get, a, and I'm making these numbers up, a 2,000 square foot house and it would cost me 1,200 bucks a month because rates were at two or three. But now that same house is going to cost me 500 bucks more a month. I might put that decision off. And if I put that decision off, that means there are less buyers competing to buy my house. So if my son just bought a house in College Park, which uh, I think everybody listening probably knows is a fairly hot real estate market. And there were literally like three houses for sale in 32804 at the moment. And he got into a bidding war with half a dozen people. That will stop when rates go up because people won't be able to leverage their money like they did even four or five or six months ago. And that's happening quickly. That's... I mean, that was the only reason we got the house. Like, they're like, this mortgage rate has never literally happened before because uh, it was just so low. And it was much less than my rent was by a lot. But th- the scary part is like, oh, you can refinance later and your mortgage rate will go up a little bit. But that, that just a percentage, you know, 1%. You think 1%, all right, that's that, then it goes up to th- three then. Yeah. That's several hundred dollars. It can, it certainly can be, especially on a more expensive home. But it's and it's psychological. People are trying to, you know, uh, you, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but your generation still is kind of in the rental mode. You know, yeah, I, I think, I'm an outlier. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a hangover from 2008, right? When the house, because you saw your parents, or some people saw their parents, or their grandparents, or their uncle, or somebody get smoked. Oh, dude, I mean, my buddy, he he was buying houses left and right. Out of nowhere, <laughs> and, and I was jealous of it at the time. I'm like, oh, look at it, look at this, all these houses. How the heck is he doing this? Yeah. And I was jealous. And then the everything, all the balloon mortgages or whatever came to be, and he lost everything. Yeah, I mean, and it happened to lots of grown people, people yeah. who who probably should have. You know, it's a it, it, simple adage. If it sounds too good to be true, it almost always is. And people thought, well, if market's appreciating, stock houses are appreciating 9%, 10%, a year. That'll continue forever. Why? Because of recency bias. That's what happened yesterday. Clearly, that's what's – I mean, when you're in a taxi cab or in an Uber and all the drivers want to talk about is the real estate market, that should be your first sign to say, hmm, maybe this thing's getting a little too heated and – uh, this tree probably won't grow to the now, sky. Now, can that happen again, though? Because that, I mean, it was. In 2008 was a devastating time. It was like, I was just getting on my feet, and it seemed like everything fell apart. Can this happen again? Well, not only can it, it will. And it kind of has. If you look at the, the best real estate markets were like 05, 07, years like that. Well, 2021 were very similar in terms of appreciation. So it, it actually has happened again to some degree. The difference this time, I would argue, um, at least loosely, that there is less debt in the system, less leverage. Like your people, like your buddy, can't put five grand down on a five hundred thousand dollar house. Yeah, that now that was the disappointing part where I had to put down an actual, you know, a real number real that number. made sense. Yeah, nobody likes that. I was, and then I got jealous and nostalgic for uh, 2008 again. But we we know not to do that. And if you want to know what not to do, as well as what to do, stay tuned to It's Only Money. And again, if you want to talk to Scott personally, you can go to EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com or 407-648-1881. We will be right back. 
Welcome back to It's Only Money with financial advisor Scott Brown with Edgewater Family Wealth. You want to get a hold of Scott, that number again, 407-648-1881. Now, Scott, I, like I said, I am an outlier. I am a millennial with a home, which is, uh, is fun. But I don't necessarily feel like I know anything about finance other than like I saved money, it was hard, and then I was able to buy a house. But that's as much of that that I got. Now, when it goes into actual the finance and the world of the stock market and, and the mutual funds and all that kind of stuff, you have to have like some kind of genius level or college educated, you know, degree at this point, right? That is not correct. In fact, sometimes it's um, it can be counterproductive. I've been in the business thirty five years, and um, the people that I see that are most successful are not the people who you would call, I would call them, um, quantifiably smart, meaning they can do calculus on a napkin and they, you know, that kind of algebra and things like that come to them pretty easily. We consider those people when we were kids smart, right? Mm-hmm. Kids that were always in the advanced classes. Um, the rest of us were back eating paste, but the, <laughs> it was so good. It is good paste. Uh, it's the Elmers, I think. I yeah. love that. Flavor. Well, see, the problem was that, that was before GMOs came in and ruined paste. Right. But now, now <laughs> it's, it's just all, orga- it's straight up organic now paste. Now it's organic paste. It's <laughs> not nearly as good. Uh, but we did consider it, we do and still do consider those people very smart, and we need them the engineers and the doctors and the physicists and things like that. I certainly am, am not in that category. But the people that I see uh, do the best are the people who understand what they don't understand. You know, there's been studies done on confidence levels and people who least understand something tend to be more confident than people who are even experts. There's a whole study on I've seen that study. study. Yeah. Um, and, and so the people in the middle, the people who understand what they don't understand and are comfortable, have the humility to kind of behave that way, are the ones that do the best. They let people, advisors guide them, or even if they don't have an advisor, they just kind of set it and forget it. I know if I buy the S&P, 19 out of the last 30 years, it was up 10%. On average, I might earn 7 or 8%. No, I'm not going to double my money overnight, but I'm okay with that. And, and to my point, back in 1998, uh, there was a company or an investment group called Long-Term Capital. They were led by two Nobel Prize winners. So I want you to think about genius. Two guys yeah. who won Nobel Prizes. For mathematics. It's the best of the best. Best, smartest, biggest eggheads you ever met in your life, right? And these guys came up with an algorithm that was flawless. And it was flawless right up until it wasn't. Um, and, and, le- and, and it dropped, I believe, somewhere in the 30 to 40% range in a very short period of time. Ooh. It required the government to step in and back these guys up because there is no perfect algorithm where, where people make mistakes. And, and I'm going to generalize here, so don't call me or write me any nasty letters. But sometimes people who are quantifiably smart, engineers, physicians, people, scientists, they're the worst investors because to them, the markets make no sense. It should be X plus Y equals Z. Mm-hmm. That's how their world works. You put in this, if you're building a bridge, this much water, this much concrete, this much rebar. And there's a, there's a math to that and it always works. Well, most of the time. And, and to them, that should be true of investing. I should be able to say, if I buy a company that has these earnings in this sector at this time and pays this dividend and has a beta score of this and a, a standard deviation of that, it should equal success all of the time. And that is not a thing. And people who are, have quantifiable intelligence, as I like to call it, struggle with the randomness of that because they don't like that it's not occurring in sequence. There's no sequence for them. The sequence is sometimes we make money, sometimes we don't. But if you're patient, you'll more often than not over a long term period, you will indeed make money. Is 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 the trick there? It's it's the people and the like. Just the you can't mathematically put, you know, a, a crazy CEO tweeting out something nutty or uh, just a, some fight, some weather disaster that wipes out futures. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, right? It, the things that really drive markets sometimes we have no ability to know. You could have sat down in in August of, of 2001, right? And you could have said, well, I, I done the math. I've checked on the manager. I've looked at the company. I've driven down there. I've seen their headquarters. Um, I've talked to a thousand employees. The stock is, earnings to sales are great. Price to earnings are great. Everything's great. People love their product. And then 9-11 happened and the stock dropped 30%, right? So that's, you no matter how much research you do, no matter how much thought you put into it, you cannot avoid the dips. 
And this is where people get in trouble because then what happens is they believe the logic that led them to the good decision about buying the stock that eventually fell. Now they think, well, there's a flaw in my logic. So I have to sell the stock and reevaluate my logic when in reality, there's no logic in that moment. There's no logic in the crisis we had in 08 with too much leverage in the system, with all these derivatives falling apart, that Le Lehman goes out. There's, you didn't sit down and prepare. You said, well, I think these three things are going to happen. You didn't do that, right? Same is true of Ukraine right now. You could have sat down and said, look, I'm going to buy Microsoft. I'm going to buy Apple. I'm going to buy Amazon. And here's why. I've got, they've got great leadership. They have great products. It's all wonderful. The sales are good. The numbers are great. The beta scores are great. The deviations are great. Sharp ratios. And you could think of every technical reason why you like the stock. And then Russia invades Ukraine and your stock goes down 25% anyway. Womp womp. Right? Yeah. So, so again, being smart is helpful. But sometimes if you are overconfident about how your intelligence translates to investing, it can get you in even more trouble than if you didn't, you weren't quantifiably smart. Now, but it always seems like there's a way, like it, even with the, the, the 2008 market, there are people that saw it, right? There's, there's people that like can see certain things from time to time. And those people are going to be like, I got the hot tip. I got this scoop for you. I got the info that no one else knows. Those guys got to be right every once in a while, right? Um, you know, in to be fair, in 08, there were a couple of people, uh, the big short, there was a movie made about the big short and the guy who kind of figured out that these companies couldn't afford the leverage they had out there and knew at some point they were going to fall apart. That's a, that's a rare occurrence. And that in that case, the math actually played out because that was just, there's this much debt and this much property supporting it. And that doesn't make any sense in that case, as is often the case with debt instead of stocks. Now you're talking about a different market. That is somewhat quantifiable, and I would argue that's the thing. But, you know, sometimes somebody will say to me, you know, I, I, I read this thing. I read it. Okay, you read it. So other people read it too. Yeah, but I think I may be the only person who read Barron's that day, <laughs> right? So people, there's, you know, 100 million people reading research on markets every single day of the week. So if you're in your mind, you think, well, I know something other people don't know. That's called insider information. Right, mm. which no regular person is going to have. I, you know, I overheard at lunch some guy talking to another guy. Right, that's that's nonsense. If you think something you read in the journal or in Barron's or name your publication, The Economist, whatever it is, has led you to some top secret conclusion, I would point out to you that there's probably 50 million other people who read that same thing. And it's not as top secret as you probably think it is. But what about this argument where it's like, okay, I'm reading this. I'm smart. Other smart people are reading this. They're going to go into this stock, thus raising up the price. Still a hot tip. Again, by the time you read something in the journal or Barron's, it is commonly known on the street. So oh. you're a little late to the game. And, there's, and I can't think of the name of this theory, but there's actually a theory that kind of throws that all out anyway. If you said, if I said to you, look, uh, here's what happens. On the last Wednesday of every month, Ryan, you should buy stocks because on the last Thursday of every month, they always go up, right? This is Sounds good. This is a study I've done. And then you, you say, yeah, that's cool. And then other people start to figure that out. And eventually, everybody's buying stocks on Wednesday. So now the stocks aren't going up on Thursday. They're going down because everybody's selling because they went up on Wednesday because everybody started buying on Wednesday, right? So these things have a way of kind of filtering themselves out, these brilliant theories people have for a minute. Um, <laughs> It, that minute goes by quickly, and then you wish you had just stuck to blocking and tackling and being a long-term investor. Yeah, I, but the, the hot tips are so sexy, Scott. You know, like, you, you, you see them, and you're like, "You got money? Look at this guy. He says he's making this return. I got, I got, I gotta get it. There has to have been a hot tip that was right once. You know, because we would do that. We don't, we don't think about the thousand times it was wrong. We see the one time it did work, and that's that's what we go for. Because again, when you tell me like the S M P. It, it, it does this every time. I, I know it does, Scott. I know it no, does. It does it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you look back again in t over time, it's, it's just – if you looked back 30 or 40 or 50 years ago before Google and all of these search engines that we have, and you said maybe in the 50s or the 40s, maybe even as late as the 60s, some insider people who are on Wall Street all day, every day, might have some better knowledge than you. Even then it was illegal to trade on, but it was probably more prevalent. 
So yeah, if you were a rich dude and you lived in Manhattan and your broker was down on Wall Street and he might know something before everybody, that's what, that was a possibility, I suppose. It was still illegal, but it was a possibility. Today, there's not a single piece of information that's out there that you can't get your hands on. If it's, if it's publicly known, if it's legal to disseminate, it's out there for everybody to see. So it's silly to think you have some kind of inside tip. You just you like to rain on my parade, Scott. And, I do, and I appreciate it though, because you're correct, and that's the problem. Because the, the the ads for the, the these brokerage firms and everything, they don't. It's never the sad people. This is these are the people who lost. It's always happy people mm-hmm. uh, making money. Yeah, well, they're not going to put ads of people that are sad in there and are you know out there for the people to go look how depressed these people are. Please invest with us. That seems like <laughs> that's like writing a book that says I never made anyone rich. That's I a terrible say, marketing yeah. plan. <laughs> but I trust that more, and uh, you can as well. And Scott Brown can be reached uh, at four zero seven six four eight one eight eight one or Edgewater Family Wealth. Dot com. Stay tuned for more. It's only money. Welcome back to It's Only Money with financial advisor Scott Brown. Tammy is here as well. I'm Ryan Holmes. And here's the thing. We were just talking about how the brokerage ads, though, they show the happy people. And uh, of course, they look at these people. They're making money. Emotionally, you look at that and you just kind of connect. You, you, you never think about the opposite end because you, like, like you said, the markets do go down for periods of time. It's just what it does. So am I being emotionally manipulated at all times? 100%. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, they're in the marketing business. No different than selling you a Coke or a, a, a Twinkie or anything else. It's Or a car. Um, you are being emotional because, you know, they never – you know, a car ad always has some immensely attractive human being driving around carefree with the wind blowing in their hair and yeah. everything's cool and, and life is perfect uh, because, you know, that's what we picture ourselves as that person, right? <laughs> yeah, that could I, be me. I, I like that. that the, 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 the weird version of marketing that I do know about cars is you, when you watch a car commercial, you, you notice there's never a license plate mm. and it's always like built into the car for some reason. It's because people are have a bias towards other states. Sure. So if they saw like a California license plate on a car, they'd be like, I'm not getting that. Californians drive that. Yeah. And then they, they've learned not to do that. So th- that's real. It's the, it's the subtle little things that you don't know you're being emotionally manipulated with. Oh, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of experiments on human behavior that go into those ads. So yeah, I mean, if you see an ad for a big brokerage firm and you know, it's a, it's a, couple in their early 60s and they're on a sailboat and they're dressed to the nines and they look like a polo ad. I want that sailboat money. It's just like chilling on and somebody gets a drink and everybody's smiling and laughing. I mean, that's who doesn't want that? Exactly. I mean, come on. You know, there's no no conversation about loss or ups and downs or the trials and tribulations or where'd that dividend go or my damn paperwork got lost or, yeah. you know, my broker's been on vacation for four months. I can't get a hold of them. That, you know, this, that's not a good ad, right? And, and so there, there are realities that they leave out of those things because we are emotional. We're, we'll talk about this till they throw us off the air, but we are emotional beings. Um, that part of our brain, our, ref, our reflexive brains uh, dominate any conversation we have, whether we think so or not. Yeah, they never show the the, the 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 time the lady was like, why did you invest in this? You lost all the money. <laughs> Herbert, get in here. What have you done? <laughs> exactly. Might not even be their boat. Might be a rented boat. But there are so many tricks. Like I, I, I've seen enough documentaries on how casinos work, you know, like uh, where all, all the little stuff that they do from the no clocks to the to the uh, pumping in air that smells a certain way. And your phone does it the same way. That's why I, I literally had to turn off notifications for my stock trading app. Because it's, uh, they still snuck one in. Yep. Uh, and it pops up and it goes, oh, it's up right now. I'm like, up right now, that's good. All right, or it's down right now. Set. And, and it brings out this trigger in me of like, I got to move fast. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what they want, right? If you're on a trading platform, they get paid for you to trade. If you, if you bought the S&P 500 on a trading platform and did nothing, they would hate you because <laughs> you are a loss leader for them. Yeah. If you, but if they remind you, for those of you who have seen The Social Dilemma, if they remind you like it was in The Social Dilemma where they're pinging you to, you know, whether it's politics, who knows, but they know what your trigger over, after watching you on your phone for the last five, 10 years, they know what triggers you. And if, uh, if a green or a red button pops up on your phone and you're like, oh, you know, my 
Bitcoin did this, I better do that. That's what they want. Mm. And then next week, they're going to send you the opposite signal, so you'll buy it back again, right? So They've gotten me several times. Don't, don't yeah. kid yourself. These people know exactly what they're doing. And again, somebody will say, well, that's capitalism. Yeah, that is capitalism. So buyer beware, right? I'm not one of those people who thinks we need to regulate away all the risk in every conversation or save people from themselves all the time. Although in some instances, I think it's a, a, a worthwhile conversation about who we're saving from what. But just be aware of your own emotions. And that's, uh, again, the be- I, I tell this story all the time. I've told it on the air. I'll tell it again. You know, When I go to a 401k meeting and there's always some angry person in the crowd staring at me and it's always a dude in his late 50s, early 60s and my plan sucks and the returns suck and the funds suck and everything sucks and he's very angry and then I find out later he's 60 and he has no money saved. He's really mad at himself and and he's he's an expert, you know. He's well. This is why your funds are bad, and yada yada. Not not even really stopping to think. He doesn't know, even know what's in the funds. What he knows is he's not done what he needs to do, and he's got to blame somebody. Whereas there's there's always a, a, and I think always think of this same teacher who's been a client of mine forever, who's a, just a delightful human being, who's never once looked at the account. I don't think doesn't know what's in it, doesn't know what the stocks are. And it's not because she's not intelligent; she's very intelligent. She's certainly more emotionally intelligent than my hypothetical guy, right? She has over a million dollars in her 401k. And it's because she just let it do what it does. She would reach out to me. We would have conversations. Maybe as you're getting closer to retirement, we'll make this change or that change. But it wasn't a daily activity. It was a once or twice a year, we would have a thoughtful, hour-long, meaningful conversation to say, all right, what has shifted in our goals? What has shifted in our needs? Are we getting a little closer to retirement? Are we going to go another two or three years? Are we going to work part-time? And then make the adjustments that are associated with that. Not, I have a hot tip and uh, I think this mutual fund's better than that mutual fund. That's Those are silly conversations. Not to say they don't have any merit, but they have far less merit than most people think. Now, is that basically what you're doing? You're taking the lizard brain part out of people's hands and do, doing it. Now, when you, you do your job, which obviously you do it very well. Are you looking at other people's money the same way you would look at your own? Or are you looking at it in a very almost like clinical way where you're like, okay, well, this is the moves they need to make, A plus B. Or is there any version of like just kind of experience and gut feeling play into it at all? Um, I mean, I think the experience and uh, we could call it a gut feeling is the gut feeling is more on how I view the person mm-hmm. emotionally. Do I see, are they emotionally stable in terms of their money? Are they, are, where, what do they say about money? How do they feel about money? How have they reacted in the past? Um, what, what led them to me in the first place? What did they say bothered them? What did they say made them happy? That's the gut part where I'm trying to decide how to design this portfolio that still gets them where they're going that doesn't trigger any of their emotional issues. Because that's hard part of the game, right? If I build a portfolio that I believe over the long haul, based on all the historical data and back testing that Tammy does over here, and we say this portfolio works. You know, if we look back a hundred years, yeah, there were bad years, yeah, there were good years, but this got this caused this person to retire comfortably, live on the income they wanted and still not run out of money when they die, right? Those are the primary objectives for most people. But if I, then I have to kind of add in this special sauce and the special sauce is what are their, what's their emotional makeup? How are they going to react? Because if I put them in, let's say they need to earn five or six or 7% and I know uh, that uh, to get seven, I need to be a little bit more aggressive. But then I think to myself, well, but if I throw some small caps or mid caps or international and there's something that might be a little more volatile, I might not be able to keep them in their seat. So I might opt to tone it down a little bit there to the six and a half range to say, look, I don't think we're going to get to seven. Let's adjust some other stuff that six and a half works because I'm afraid to get you seven or eight. And again, I'm making this all up, but you can kind of get the, the gist of it is is I want to keep you in your seat. And I believe based on the story you told me about your uncle 22 years ago, you'll probably react this way. Therefore, I want to keep you from shooting yourself in the foot. So there's all of those things are part of the conversation. Is there like a minimum amount of money that, to get into this, like to have a financial advisor? Is It largely depends on the advisor. Um, our firm is big enough. We have enough advisors. I mean, my minimums are a little bit higher than most probably. 
Um, but our team is accessible to any level of investor. And I do pro bono work sometimes. I, I can't do a bunch of it, obviously. There's a limit in time. But I have at least four or five people come in every year that are young and trying to figure things out. And I have a conversation with them. I had one just the other day with a young man who was a friend, who was a friend's son. And I talked to him for a half an hour and kind of gave him some do's and don'ts. And he went about his merry way. He will probably not be a client of mine anytime soon. Um, but no, we have members on our team that can do that um, and do the kind of the, the beginning portion of financial planning, which to me is the critical part. Yeah. You know, if a, if, a, if a kid walks into my office, a young lady walks into my office and she's 26 years old and she's trying to figure out how to use her 401k and she's trying to learn how to save and she's what are the tax deductions, what's a Roth, all of these things. And I can convince her to save seven or eight or nine or 10% of her income versus the one she was thinking about doing, I'm going to have far more impact on her life long-term than, than the, the gal that walks into my office with $5 million and just wants to maximize tax benefits and get a better return, right? Because th- that person's already rich. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I will make an impact on that person's life, and that is my kind of my bread and butter client, but I didn't do that. Hence my book, I Never Made Anyone Rich. <laughs> now, to be fair, my book's a little bit of a lie because I can point to several people over the last 30 years that I have twisted their arm to get in their 401k, to maximize the match, to use a Roth, or to uh, better utilize the tax implications of any particular product or, or plan. And those people, I could argue, someday will be rich because of a conversation they had with me. At least I hope so. Now you're going to have to then change the title of your book yeah, again. That's it's the like, I made part. like two people wish. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, There'll I, be a I, new version every year as that number grows. Yeah, because you've just been in the business for so long, yeah. over 30 years. Someone has had to have been, you know, th- you know, 35, is retired at 65 now. So I, I would say your numbers are probably a little bit higher than you think they are. Yeah, no, I, I think that's probably true. And that's the thing I take the most pride in. Yeah, I mean, you've got to walk away. I mean, it's, it, you're literally helping people live a comfortable and arguably better life you know it's, it's, i would say there's something you you probably don't go to bed at night going what am i doing with my life right uh well some days but <laughs> <laughs> but no for the most part it's a very fulfilling occupation well awesome and if you want to work with scott edgewaterfamilywealth.com is the website or 407-648-1881 is the number we'll be right back with more it's only money Welcome back to It's Only Money with financial advisor Scott Brown with EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com, 407-648-1881. Tammy is here as well. Hello, Tammy. Hello. All right. Now, we were talking about the app earlier and uh, just how I respond to the triggers that they give, uh, but you told me something super interesting, which is people respond to the possibility of making more money than they do just like some money. Yeah. I mean, well, think of it. What they respond to is the number. So, you know, the odds of, you know, when the lottery's at a million, that's the best example I can think of. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously less people play it yeah, than when the- Just a, a million. Just, who wants that? Waste I mean, of time. I don't even want to go down and pick that up. That sounds like <laughs> a waste of time. But when it's 10 million or 100 million, everybody wants to play. And, and what's interesting about that is you're statistically less likely to win, right? Because the odds go way down. As the lottery increases, everybody's like, sees that big number on mm-hmm. the billboard, and I got to go get me seven tickets, right? Right. Um, and so why you would say to yourself, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, your odds of winning have just gone down. But to for our, our reptilian brains say to themselves, well, 10 million, I can't, I can't. I can't turn that down. I got to go get 10 million. Well, you're less likely to win the 10 than the one. So again, the size of the number kind of, even though it makes no sense logically, people are attracted to the idea of, and again, this is our shortcut brain. Our brain is always looking for the shortcut. It's always looking for, and I I assume that has served us when we were running around in the plains and running from saber-toothed tigers and whatnot. Well, where the heck is the shortcut? (laughs) Because I'm going to get eaten, right? So as I've said many times, if your ancestors didn't pattern seek or take shortcuts, well, you wouldn't be here, right? Because th- those people would have been eaten. So no, it's it's a natural impulse we have. I, I don't really know what to make of it other than, you know, clients will do occasionally, not very often, but they'll say, hey, man, I I think I can make 50 grand doing this thing. And the odds of that thing are one in a thousand. And I say, well, why don't you do this other thing where you can make 10 grand and the odds are two out of three. Mm-hmm. Right, because that's that's the long term nature of the market. Your odds of making money in the S and P five hundred, at least based on historical data, 
are almost 100% if you stay in it long enough. And it, it, it is 100%. When yeah. I was, I like to tell the story when I started in the business in 1987. Uh, I, I apologize to my dad in advance. My dad said, what are you doing? You know, the 1987, the, the, the Dow was at 2,000, give or take. And he said, what are you doing? The market's 2,000. It's, it's not, that's it. It's not going any higher. Well, the Dow's at 34 and some change today. Mm, yeah. 34,000. <laughs> so 17X or whatever that works out to be mathematically. So, I, know, I tried to do math on the show last week and I yeah, got called out totally for it. So I'm not doing that the again. Ball there. <laughs> um, so, you know, peop- so that tells you that it does work. In between, do we get punched in the gut and we have a bad day and the market looks sloppy and you want to get out, but you really shouldn't? My point is there's a 100% chance of making money in the S&P 500 based on historical data if you just hang in there long enough. People don't like that story, Ryan. No. You want me to sit there and do nothing? You would just, what, I just go about my life and get rich? Who wants that? (laughs) Actually, now that I've said it out loud, that seems like the best way. Right. Go fishing. Go play (laughs) golf. Go to work. Spend some time with your family. It'll take care of itself, but nobody likes that. No. Everybody wants the shortcut. Everybody wants the idea of the big money quick. And I will tell you, that's a silly dream too, because we know that money's acquired quickly through inheritance or lottery winnings or windfalls of any kind. The odds of those people having that money for an extended period of time are like one in three. Yes, I am a sucker for these shows about lottery winners mm-hmm. and what they've gone through, and it's always... There'd be like one family that's like, yeah, they they put their money into this and they live off the 40 grand a month that it gives them. And then there's the guy who just spends it all yep. and loses it all because you don't you, it, you, you don't have a concept of a million, really, you know, and, and, and how fast that yeah. can go. Gone in a second. For some reason, I can budget out my $2,000 in my bank account every single time. Sure. But if you told me I had 200000 it would be gone. Like, it, if you just gave it to me. It's abstract to people. Yes. And especially to people, we talked about this, I think, last week, is that 50% of the lottery tickets sold in the state of Florida are bought by 5% of that the population. That blew my mind. And that 5% of the population is the reason they're buying so many lottery tickets is because they're not good with money, right? If you were good with money, you wouldn't buy a lot of lottery tickets. So, And then the other things that happens to people is they win the lottery if we're going to stay on that path. And somebody says, well, don't take the payment. Don't take the two hundred grand a year. Who mm-hmm. wants two hundred grand a year, right? Take the $7 million discounted from the $12 million you won. And then they get this big pot of money. Two or three million go to taxes. They buy a couple people cars. All their new friends want stuff. They're buying drinks everywhere. And before they turn around, they're out of money. And worse yet, now they're borrowing to sustain their lifestyle. And that's where everything becomes unwound. Well, it just boils down to like financial literacy is not something that is taught to us at all. Unless you have really good parents that are like business people uh, you just don't ever come across that advice. You have to go out of your way. Maybe you get older, you search it on YouTube, but there, I got nothing in school. I The most I got was I could. they taught me how to write a check once. I think that was the most financial. That was the advanced class. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the good news is that there's legislation just passed in the state of Florida, Bill SP 1054, which I'm sure you knew. Of course. Um, the old SP 1054. It had bipartisan which is not a word I get to say much, support. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody thought this was a good idea. It's been a good, it's something I've talked about for years. I wrote about it in my book. Um, what are we waiting for? Most of us do not use calculus when we leave. Most of us do not, uh, put, there's not a lot of practical application to understanding You know, when Picasso painted whatever he painted, although I find that stuff fascinating. It's not that practical, mm-hmm. and you can always read about it later in life. What has happened with SP 1054 is they've created, I think for ninth graders, um, a class uh, that addresses financial literacy. And in fact, I have the list here, so bear with me while I read it to you. But it it talks about uh, the class covers types of bank accounts offered, balancing a checkbook. There's an idea. Does anybody even look at a checkbook anymore, by the way? I have I have never once used the register of a checkbook. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true of your generation. It's just all done online. Yeah, I mean, you're just looking at my son and my daughter just look at their phones. This is what I have. This is what I spent. Yes. So they're doing a reconciliation right there on the spot. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, however they go about doing that, it's still not a bad thing. Basic principles of money management, such as credit. Think about credit. Think about how you can mess up your credit when you're a young person by overbuying a car or 
Now it gets repossessed, and now you got seven years to deal with that on your credit report. And then you got some money, and you wanted to buy a house, but your credit report was kind of Swiss cheese. And they said, well, we can give you money, but the rate's going to be 20%. You know, all these things kind of add up. Um, and I think in certain communities where poverty is prevalent, they don't learn these concepts, and it puts them even further behind the eight ball where, you know, uh, I wasn't taught this by my parents. I didn't learn this in school. So this, I think this is a great thing, completing a loan application, managing debt. Compounding uh, interest, if it would have been explained to me properly, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble. Well, and that goes back to the long-term nature of the of just buy again, I'm saying the S and P, the Dow, whatever, just being a long term investor, but you think about compounding interest and you say, Well, how does that apply to the stock market? Well, if you look back over the last sixty or seventy years, and again, these are estimates, these are Scott Brown wild guesses, but I think <laughs> they're pretty close, is that if the markets earn seven or eight percent hypothetically over an extended period of time, thirty or forty percent of that return comes from dividends, which go in and buy more shares so that you have more shares that go up in price, right? That is the magic of compounding kind of exponentially growing in the stock market, right? So that's a thing. Um, taxes. Wow, that's something we all need to learn about. Who know nothing about that. Just literally give so much money to H&R Block every year and then just like, okay, it's done. You know, but I don't know what they're doing. Well, they're giving it to the government and they're buying $800 toilet seats. I don't know what they're doing with it. But, <laughs> but you know, we just talked about the $44 trillion debt that's appears to be coming in 2032 unless somebody sane gets elected and does something about it, which there's not a high probability of. So with that understood, um, taxes are not going down. No. It's, it's, I don't care what party you're a fan of, which team you root for. They're all doing the same thing. They're all overborrowing and overspending. Now, they overborrow and overspend on different things, uh, and they argue about which things they want to overspend on, which is the only thing they have in common is let's overspend but not on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to, you got to understand the tax code. You got to understand not, you're not trying to cheat the tax code, but you certainly want to maximize the opportunities that exist within the 7 billion pages, slight exaggeration of tax code that's out there. But yeah, so this bill I, I think is, is a really nice start. SB 1054, it talks about simple contracts when you're looking at a real estate contract. Um, I don't know if you've seen a real estate contract, but there, you know, there's, Dozens and dozens and dozens of pages that nobody understands. As Seen I, it, signed them, yep. didn't read a word. Yeah, so that's that's <laughs> the irony of regulation, right? The more forms they make people sign, the less they read them. I, I like to tell this story because uh, just, I think it's hilarious to this day. When I bought my first house a few years ago, I was 26 at the time, I looked up at my buddy starting to sign the forms, and I said, hey, man, what are all these forms? And he looked at me in his Texas accent and said, Scotty, it don't matter if you don't sign it. You ain't getting a house. <laughs> so that's kind of where forms are. So, yes, I believe this bill is a good step in the right direction, and I think young people will be better for it. Awesome. Well, again, if you want to get a hold of Scott, that number is 407-648-1881. He's with Edgewater Family Wealth. That website's edgewaterfamilywealth.com. Scott, Tammy, great what? show. Good seeing you, fellas. Pleasure being here. Thank you, sir. And we'll see you again next Sunday on It's Only Money. Yeah, and clearly people are rich, right? Or wealthy. You don't have to be rich. I like the term wealthy better. I mean, to rich reminds me of like the Monopoly guy or something. But, you know, they're people. They're regular people. <laughs> that guy I trust. Yeah, you see, no. the problem, Scott, you don't have a monocle. Monocle is, now, if you can meet a guy with a monocle, I mean, like, I'm all in. What was his financial advice? He said buy Park, please? Yeah, I don't, where is that? Where is that? I can't find it. <laughs> Tune into It's Only Money with Scott Brown from Edgewater Family Wealth, Sunday mornings at 7 on Real Radio 104.1. Raymond James Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA, Edgewater Family Wealth is not a broker-dealer. It's independent of RJFS.